All right. Um, hey, this is Melanie Dizon from the Davis Finney Foundation. I'm here with Jackie Hansen. How you doing, Jackie? Good. How are you? Cool. Good, good, good. Um, so we are going to be talking about music therapy today. And you are a program manager and you make all of our fabulous videos, but I don't think a lot of people know that you're also a certified music therapist. So I think interesting would be for you to tell the story of how you even got hooked up with us in the first place. Yeah. How I made the switch. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So technically I'm a certified music therapist and I went through several years of schooling, especially with COVID interruptions and whatnot to get my master's in music therapy. Um, and I was at that point in time fully intending on being a full-time working music therapist, particularly with children, actually, because I've always really loved kids. Um, and then it came time. I had finished my program. I had my certification. I was ready to go. But another interest of mine has always been working in the nonprofit realm of things. And so when it came time to applying for jobs, I started applying to both. And the Davis Finney Foundation came up and was of interest to me because I'd worked with a lot of people with Parkinson's as a music therapist. I'd done Parkinson's choirs. I'd done one-on-one -on -one client sessions. Um, and so I had kind of some experience with that, which gave me the in into the Davis Finney Foundation. And yeah, so I just pursued that, that half of my passions and let music therapy kind of go or be on the side. Um, and since then, I've gotten to move into video and audio production and program management. And it's been a really awesome switch. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, we haven't really had the chance to um, expose your greatness around music therapy. <laughs> and you have so much to offer. So I'm excited to finally get to be able to sit down with you. So, um, so we hear a lot about why music is good for people with Parkinson's. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that? Why is it so good? Yeah, well, um, the first thing I'll say is that the reason that music is so cool and whether this is in like a specific music therapy, music therapist realm, or just there's so many programs around the country that are using music, right? right? Like Parkinson's choirs or, um, you know, there's a lot of drumming groups that happen and all this kind of stuff is that music is so versatile and it's so global in the brain as far as what it can affect. And there's also so many different ways you can use music. So, you know, there's music listening, there's music composition, there's music improvisation, there's music practicing. Like there's so many different elements to it. You can use your voice, you can use your hands, you can use your feet, you know? And so um, it really has the potential to impact all areas of the brain in different ways. And Parkinson's is a really unique condition because also all parts of the brains are being affected because when you lose that dopamine that doesn't just affect motor symptoms as you know and we know it affects everything and so the two just play really nicely together in that if there's kind of an issue that needs to be addressed over here there's probably a way that music can can tackle it oh that's so cool so um let's talk a little bit about how so people will hear music, like you said, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to go to um, like we have the tremble class here in Boulder or they'll mm -hmm. go anywhere else with music or drumming. But what is the difference between just like music practice or a music class and music therapy? Yeah. Uh, and this is something that any music therapist is always happy to expand on because there's so many different ways to use it. So um, music therapy, the way that I like to describe it as I, we had to practice our elevator pitch a lot as students of what it really was. And I like to, I like to compare it to the other therapies you think of. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, even other complementary ones like massage therapy, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's really where you go through a very specific training for a music therapist. It's four years of undergrad or like a three-year master's equivalency program. And then once you're trained, you go and work with a population and you approach it in a very therapeutic sense. So you go to your client and you think of what are the goals here and they can be any number of things. And then you track it, you track your progress, you create actual like protocols and interventions using music and it's kind of a very clinical thing. Um, and some of the other things that are out there, they're still utilizing the really amazing benefits of music that it can have, but it's just from a different approach. So if you're, if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, I want piano lessons and I have Parkinson's cool. They'll have piano lessons 
and there's a lot of things that are happening therapeutically there. You know, there's a lot of benefits they're getting from that, but I'm not approaching that as a music therapist. I'm just teaching them an instrument and there's all these other side good things that are happening too. So that's really the primary difference. And then there's some other subtleties too, which we can go into later if you want to. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of think of it like there's yoga and there's yoga therapy and some people will be like, Oh, you know, I'm a yoga therapist. They're not, you know, they, the yoga mm-hmm. therapy, a training for that requires, you know, 2000 X plus hours on top of just being a, a yoga teacher. Um, and so they approach it by looking at, Oh, okay, here's your goal. And here's, here's really what's happening with the body. There's a lot more anatomy and physiology with that. Um, mm-hmm. and there's a lot more sort of specific interventions. So as a music therapist, can you give us an example of maybe two different, um, issues that people came to you with that, you know, go beyond that. I want to take a piano lesson that are like, here's what I, here's my challenge and here's what I want to do. And then some things that you maybe you did to help with them. Yeah. Um, would you like specifically maybe someone with Parkinson's or just yes. anybody? Yeah. With Parkinson's. Parkinson's would be great. Yeah. Um, well, so one thing that I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go to the Parkinson's choir thing. So there's Parkinson's choirs that are led by music therapists. And there's also Parkinson's choirs that are not necessarily led by music therapists, but they still have benefits, right? Um, So one thing that we'll focus on a lot when leading a Parkinson's choir is vocal loudness, vocal articulation, and speed. Because as Parkinson's progresses, often you get the quickening of speech, some slurring, and just softening of voice. And they're not always aware of it too. That's kind of an interesting component of it is they don't hear that it's soft, but others do. So one thing we'll do is let's say for the first 10 minutes of choir, we'll start with warm-ups. And there's an old song and I wish I could remember what it was. I think it's the introduction to a cartoon or something, but it's got a ton of like uh, Ta, tu, ta, ti, ta, pa, ta, pa, something like that. It's got a ton of articulation. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's it. Yeah. So we would do that, but we would do it really slowly and really be making sure that they're making overly big movements. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, uh-huh. you know? um, and so that's really focusing on practicing that articulation, practicing going slowly um, and then in the same in the same vein, as far as vocal loudness, you know, we'll make sure and include dynamics in there to really make them grow and make them go down. So they're not only recognizing what is loud and what is soft, but they're also getting that practice. Okay, yeah, and I would think there's like a lot of breathing in there too mm-hmm. that um, is super helpful and sort of calms down the um, sympathetic nervous system, right? And yeah, totally. And that. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so what are some of the great social parts about being using music um, in Parkinson's? Yeah, well, so socially, there's there's been a few studies and I can't I can't cite them for you right now, but there's been several studies that kind of say that being a part of a music group has shown to facilitate social connections more quickly hmm. than other modalities because it's a really social a social outlet. And you're also kind of sharing some certain kind of emotional bonds in a way with people. And so being able to bond over something specific like that is, is, um, is a really big deal and it helps build those social connections. Um, And also, you know, the social component, being able to do music with other people, it doesn't just improve, you know, your community or your social connections. It attacks things like depression and anxiety and some of those kind of mental health aspects, because often, those come about and get worse because people, you know, start to start to go inward. They start to not become more social. And so um, the fact that there is a community aspect to music and you're not just doing it by yourself, which you can also do Mm -hmm. um, helps more than just build community. It also helps them have a sense of purpose, be less depressed, less anxious. Um, Yeah. Just a lot of things you can do with it socially. Yeah. And I think the other thing about it, when I, I just think of Davis, um, because he, you know, does the treble clefts and never, ever seen him not in a better mood after he. Right. Does it. And uh, I think that just that, you know, pe- when people are singing, they're smiling, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they just feel good. And so yeah. just being able to do that with people, especially when you do it 
the same people every month or every week if you're lucky enough to have a class. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great way to do it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the motor function that it helps with and, and why does it help with that? Yeah, um, so the motor function is really, it's really interesting with music and there's kind of a couple different areas, <coughs> excuse me, that it can attack. So the first one that's really a lot of people have heard about with music therapy and Parkinson's is gait, right? And freezing of gait. So there's something in the brain called rhythmic entrainment. Um, and the general idea of it is that our bodies are naturally built to entrain to a steady beat, right? So, um, you know, if you're listening to a piece of music and you're doing something, sometimes your body movements will start to match up with that beat. Um, and same with, there's a lot that has to do with that, with like breathing and just the natural rhythms of our, the natural rhythmic things going on in our body. So, um, when it comes to walking and people with Parkinson's that in particular, their gait tends to be little and shuffled. Um, and also they freeze, you know, when they have a doorway or something stopping them visually, they freeze. So, what um, music therapists will do, and a lot of occupational and physical therapists have started incorporating this as well, is they'll play something with a steady beat, even if it's just a metronome, which mm -hmm. is a very specific music therapy, neurologic music therapy protocol. They play something with a steady beat, have the person walk to it, and suddenly the majority of people have this nice, smooth gait, and they're walking to the beat. They're able to turn a lot easier, so they're not freezing. Um, and so for a lot of people, that is a really amazing connection between the two. Um, another thing with motor, and this isn't exactly, this doesn't have to do with that, that entrainment gate thing so much, but it can be used for, if you think of like exercise, or if you think of, if you're doing specific physical therapy exercises as a part of a rehab or anything, um, music, the use of music in that can be a really engaging, motivating thing. So the example I like to use is that if someone, let's say is, um, I worked with somebody once who had a stroke and they were working on building up their trunk muscles and reaching farther forward, <laughs> right to the camera. It's like, whoa, that, whoa, 3D, <laughs> um, and reaching farther forward. And so what we did is we were singing one of their favorite songs. I don't remember what it was, but we'll just say, you know, it was, um, Ba Ba Black Sheep, which it definitely wasn't that. That's just the first thing that came to my mind. We had a drum that we held out in front of them and they had a mallet. And so we would sing that song and they would have to hit the drum on every steady beat of that song. And we would pull it farther and farther away. So they would have, it was just motivating them to do more motion. So get stronger, quicker. And also it's been shown to help people to do their exercises for longer you know it's like yeah. exercising to a great playlist you'd run three miles more easily than you'd run two if you're listening to Beyonce and that's your favorite artist you know what I mean so um there's kind of those two components to it which is really oh, that's cool. cool um Sam asks would you suggest using metronomes in the house to provide that smooth gait yeah I mean absolutely I think there's sometimes logistics you know to that you're not going to be playing a metronome 24 seven in your house, or you might go mad. Um, but I think that people, you know, will use it a lot if they have to go from one place to another, they have mm -hmm. to go from the kitchen to the opposite side of their house, or if they're in a, you know, crowded place, and they know they're going to possibly freeze, and that's a good time to use it. Yeah, we actually were just talking to a couple of different companies, one was next stride, and they have um, this attachment that goes onto a walker or a cane or something. And um, it gives, there's a metronome sound to it. Mm -hmm. um, rolls, the rollator for uh, people with Parkinson's that also has a, a metronome sound. Uh, a lot of people like to use it, right? Just in their headphones, if they're out and about, it's like mm -hmm. tends to be the scariest piece. Like their fear of falling, their fear of being in a crowd and freezing and kind of getting stuck in a crowd of people when they freeze. Um, and so they'll, they'll put the metronome on, which is, which is really great. Yeah. Um, the other the other big thing that, that music does uh, that I want to talk about is, is cogn cognitive help. Mm -hmm. So talk, talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so cognitively, and you mean kind of like memory and <clears throat> problem solving. Why, is, that kind of why is it good for people with Parkinson's? Yeah, well, you know, there's 
there, what I, the first thing I think of and what I think a lot of people know about cognitive and memory is kind of those old, were they Beethoven or Bach studies? I forgot, but they did something where they studied people that were learning music and what it did for them cognitively versus who weren't musicians. Um, I think they call it like, you know, brain food or something like that. Anyway, um, so it kind of goes back to that thing that music really utilizes all parts of the brain. And so if you're also really intentional about what kind of music you're doing or participating in, you're really working all parts of those brain, all parts of that brain, right? So if you're learning a song or you're practicing memorizing a song, you're practicing your short-term memory, your working memory, your long-term memory. Um, and that's just that one piece. You're, if you're you know, working through a song or let's say you're improvising, which means that you're just making it up, you're not stopping, you keep going, that's working your problem solving and your, you know, active skills to not stop and keep going. Um, and so, I mean, there's just, there's just so, there's so many things that just participating in music naturally does for you cognitively. But if you were to also see like a music therapist or somebody and you said, Hey, my memory is re- it's getting really bad. There's a lot of different exercises they could do through music, but they would just, they would just make them a little bit more potent, you know, um, that would really focus in, on practicing memory. Cause like I said, it's so versatile. I could change a song that exists to be 10 minutes long. That would require you to recite, you know, the same five words back to me 15 times plus, right. you know? So um, yeah, it's just, it just hits all those areas. And I think that's the big thing. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that um, you learn if you get a Parkinson's diagnosis and you're with a great doctor is uh, some of the things that you can do, obviously exercise, um, mm-hmm. take your medication, but learn new things mm-hmm. and keep your brain working all of the time. And one of the things that music does cognitively is that you're, um, you're dual tasking, right? So like, mm-hmm. let's say you're having somebody do a movement while also remembering a song, right? Like that's two different things that they have to do and that's keeping their brain firing. Uh, so that's, that's really good. So people sometimes, uh, will have trouble with like they're in the grocery store and you think, oh, OK, we're just walking and I'm trying to find something. But if you know, if your Parkinson's is at a point where doing those two things at once, um, the thinking about going somewhere might make you stall or, or freeze. Right. Mm-hmm. Or like make you sort of do that shuffling. And then but if you keep music on and you're and you're moving. Right. It'll just kind of help you get through that. Um, get focused on, I'm getting those pasta noodles, I'm putting them in the thing and I'm going to continue moving forward. So I think mm-hmm. there's just, um, cognitively, it's great to dual task because you're basically always doing that with music. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you're having to do something else in addition to it, it it'll help you move on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, different types of music interaction that people might consider. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I touched on this a little bit before, but um, like I said, there's lots of different ways you can actually use music. And so the first one is songwriting. People don't think about this a lot because it seems really scary, you know, and intimidating. Like, no, no, I, I don't do music. I can't possibly write a song, you know, but it's such, it's something as simple as start with something like Mad Libs, you know, where you take something that exists, you swap out a couple words and boom, you've written your own version of, we'll go b- back to Baba Black Sheep, you know, right. maybe it's Oink Oink Pig, you know, I don't know, something. Yeah. Um, and so that's something really simple. And that can be used in a lot of different ways too. Um, a lot of people find songwriting really helpful to process difficult emotions. It's kind of like journaling, but it's just, Poetry, in kind right? of an, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, exactly. Um, a lot of people will do it too, or music therapists will use it a lot, kind of, at end of life or kind of to process the, the grieving that's associated with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it can be a gift too, you know, a gift, they write a song and it's a gift passed down to their family. Um, So songwriting is one of them. Lots of things you can do with that. There's also, as we've said before, participating in music. So whether that's a drum circle or a choir or, you know, just a virtual anything, you know, listening to, listening to a concert, um, that's, that's a different category too. I'll just kind of go through and we can dig into them if we want to, um, listening to music, right? So that's in the comfort of your own home. But if you think about any time you've been anxious, 
and you turn on a song that you know is going to calm you down, that's listening to music, you know, and its power and what it can do for you. Uh, there's also moving to music. And I'm sure that all dance for PD participants and instructors would 100% understand this one. Music has a really amazing, just natural ability to, you know, move your body and it just, it just matches beautifully. Um, discussing music, that's kind of, it's kind of in the realm of songwriting, but different. And it's really taking a song that has a lot of meaning with what you're working through and just diving in. It's kind of like a journal prompt. You know, you have these words in front of you and you talk about how do these relate to me? And it's kind of like talk therapy, but working through it with music. Um, <clears throat> physically and mentally practicing music. So the reason I added mentally in there is because you don't have to practice just physically, right? There was a, this is kind of a fun little random fact, but there was a famous musician. I don't remember who he was, but I know he existed, who <laughs> he would fly from concert to concert to concert and he would play new pieces every single time. And he was asked one time, how does he practice and get so good at these pieces before he goes? And he says that on the plane, he plays through them in his mind. He just practices them in the mind. His pictures, his hands doing what has to happen nice and slow. And then he goes on stage and he can play them nearly perfectly. So, and that, think about how cognitively challenging that is. Yeah. If you are, if you're practicing something in your mind, you're having to use so many resources. So um, yeah, so using your body or mind to practice music is an amazing way. And then last, which I kind of touched on was improvising. And that's really making music up it utilizes an entirely different part of your brain than practicing something that's written in front of you. Um, it utilizes a lot more problem solving. Um, and yeah, so that's a little list, but there's just so many different ways that you can interact with it that I think people just think, oh, either I play or sing music or I don't. And I listen to music in the shower and that's where it stops. But really there's so many other things you can do. So many different things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's... Um you mentioned a couple of times drumming and I think there are a lot of people that have never heard of that, especially never heard of it for Parkinson's. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what is a drumming program for people with Parkinson's and where yeah. to learn more too? Like that's, you want to let people know about that. Yeah. Love to. I love drumming. I'll talk about drumming all day long. Um, I was actually a classical percussionist for seven or eight wow. years. Fun fact. So many fun things. I <laughs> so many fun things. Three years later, I'm still like, yeah. hey, what? Yeah. Um, yeah. So drumming, drumming for a lot of times they'll call it drumming for PD or drum circles or, you know, <clears throat> I think a lot of people just to fight a stereotype, think about a drum circle and they think about, you know, long, dirty right. hair and braids and, like you know, clothes that are, circles. yeah, yeah, clothes that are a week old and chanting, humming, you know, all this kind yeah. of stuff. Um, and that's definitely a certain kind of drum circle. If you're interested in that, you can find those. Um, but drumming for PD has gotten really popular because um, drum circles, I'm going to go back a little bit, drum circles in as like a whole. Basically, it's a community of people that get together. They each have a drum. I'd say traditionally it's a djembe, which is those drums that basically they have the animal skin head and then they come down and they have a curve. It's like mm. one of those, you know, hourglass, perfect shapes, but in a drum and you stick it between your knees and you drum like this. Um and then there's usually a facilitator. So kind of like the teacher and the facilitator, you can either drum to specific songs, right? Just like anything, you can practice very specific rhythms, very specific times you play, and then you have a set song that you're learning. But there's also a lot of improvisation that can happen with drumming. And there's different types of drumming too. And I'm, I'm trying to stop myself from going into too much detail, but, um, it's just an experience where, you know, for 45 minutes, you're just kind of following the ringmaster for lack of a better word. And you're just kind of doing what they do. And you create this, such an interesting variety of sounds all on a drum. Right. Um, and sometimes it also can include clapping or body percussion, you know, so it's a little bit of everything. And the reason it's becoming more and more popular is because number one, that community social aspect, again, um, you, you and a bunch of other people are doing the same thing and bonding over this fun shared musical experience. Right. Right. It's also really good for motor, motor control. 
Um, and that intentional movement with hands, I know can sometimes help with the tremor that happens in Parkinson's when you're doing something intentional versus just resting, it can minimize it. Um, <clears throat> so that can really help. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just fun. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest thing I'm gonna say, it's just fun. And I think that when you're engaging in those physical things that are fun, but they're also cognitively challenging you, you're having to pay attention, you're having to remember, you're having to interact with other people, you're forced to be out of your shell. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many benefits to participating in something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. Well, I think we can stop there. There's cognitive <laughs> depression, anxiety, motor, social, um, just the pure just joy of singing with other people or making music with other people is pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much, Jackie, for hanging out. Thank you. Today. And uh, we'll definitely have you back and maybe we'll do a drumming circle or something. That sounds great. I would love that. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Bye.